Welcome back to the 99, where we are focused on brewing a better competitive commander. I'm your host, Patrick Marland. Uh, I'm Ernesto Salazar. And I'm Justin Rodriguez. So this is a Talking Topics episode. That's not the name of the segment. It might become it. But we're going to be discussing what we believe competitive commander truly is. And if you watch the channel, you know we play a lot of competitive commander here. Uh, usually inebriated. That doesn't really help. But the idea uh, for the channel on the whole is to help you guys brew a better competitive commander. Even if we don't play at our competitive best here all the time, we do like playing at uh, any table we sit at our best game and we're hoping mm -hmm. we can help define what competitive is and help you play the best competitive game you can. It all depends also on our alcohol level, on the blood. So. Yeah. On the blood. Even <laughs> even on the, sorry, in the blood. Hey, I'm Spanish speaking, okay? Fine. Because it's going to be some slack. But even if we play in another table that's not this one, we might also be in a so we might not make the correct moves, but the whole idea is, as Patrick said, to motivate you to seek furthering your knowledge, your ma uh, level as a magic player. Mm -hmm. And if you can get anything from our tips, our discussions, good for you. Please try to apply them. I don't mm -hmm. know if you have anything. I mean, Commander itself is already like so convoluted and it's constantly problem solving. And then we throw the competitive tag on it. And what does that really mean? It's a lot. Yeah. So I want to actually start by defining that, uh, at least with our own definition today, because WotC doesn't have their own definition for what a competitive game of Commander is, so there really isn't truly one out there, but we all have our own take on it, and I feel like a lot of the other YouTube creators have their own take on what makes a competitive game, and just brewers in general have different feelings as to what makes a competitive game. I don't really look at this as a tier system. I don't see optimized as opposed to competitive. I see efficient and inefficient. I see decks that can be better piloted I see pilots that could better pilot a stronger list um, so really what we want to start with is just what is competitive commander so I'm gonna toss the ball to you guys I have my own thoughts on this we were discussing this off-camera earlier but what do you think makes a competitive commander game for me a game of competitive commander is trying to get a game with everyone at least this is an ideal world where everyone makes a good place and also rules are enforced as a competitive level, like a uh, tournament level. So no take backsies, uh, oh I screwed up, I was like, oh no, 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 no. Obviously you can do politics, but before you do your plays. And another thing is, deck building is a huge part, mm -hmm. at least for myself. I consider a cut of 50% on deck building. 25% on the player and 25% on other probably factors that could run around like luck, stuff like that. Board order. Board order, mm -hmm. yeah. threat assessment, other things that come into play as a magic player that is not really considered like within the scope of a normal magic player. As I, as I said, like all, the, all those other stuff. That's another 25%, but mostly on a CDH for me is deck building. Mm. If you are building your deck wrong, no matter how good as a player you are, you will fall behind people. At least in my opinion. That's true. I personally uh, place more stock into threat assessment. I think that really sets um, competitive commander aside from regular EDH. I feel like for you to play this format, your threat assessment needs to be like the best because if you have poor threat assessment, it throws the game for everybody. Completely agree, mm -hmm. but yeah, if you but if you don't have the answers the to the actual meta, then yeah, completely. Yeah, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. So to piggyback off of what Justin is saying, I don't think there there are a lot of factors that go into what makes a game more competitive. Of course, we're going to delve into some of what they actually just discussed. But me personally, I don't feel any game can truly be competitive if luck is involved. If luck is ever a factor then that hampers strategy, that hampers your own wits and controlling a game or controlling a table. And it makes the game less competitive just inherently. So if luck is ever a factor in my mind, the game can never truly be competitive. However, you can mitigate it by some degree with, you know, tutors and just more efficient cards in general. You can get through your 99 to play the most efficient game you possibly can, but you can never mitigate luck truly. So for me, I don't think competitive 
is truly a game that you could have with Commander. I think you can play very optimized, very efficient games with Commander, but no one game is ever going to be. You, know, you have the best player with the best deck, but if he just draws poorly, and there's really nothing you can do to help that. We had some games where... The, the, last, two, the last Brew Wars, yeah, when guys, we drew no lands, we no were lands, screwed, stuff yeah. like that. But example. you can't help that. And you know, I'm sure you, you decks definitely have answers for what uh, both John and I were doing in that uh, particular game. Go ahead and watch our previous Brew Wars if you haven't yet. Uh, see what we're talking about. There was a good like four to five turns where you just at didn't least, draw into lands. Least. But I mean, you and specifically... Had, we, we both had everything. Yeah, I mean, you were drawing through so many cards. So, mm. and you never... That me. I had the both I had of you. Top. I had top. I was like drawing like crazy. I think he said like, what? Serum Vision, <laughs> Brainstorm, so, Do you think there's no such thing as competitive magic in general? If it's so luck based. I honestly don't think there's such a thing as competitive magic. However, you know, I'm not going to argue that with players that play, you know, Mythic Tours or Championships. There's obviously a competitive tier system so far as how Watsi's defined it. There are people winning prizes. I think that's what makes the game competitive. If you play professionally and you earn money doing it, then you're playing at a competitive level because you're very good at what you do and you can skirt around the luck aspect. But particularly with Commander, because it is 99 card singleton, luck is a bigger factor in this particular format. Well, Obviously, when more print runs come out of new cards that have similar effects to older cards, you're gonna get the redundancies you need to hit those effects when you hopefully need them, but you can never mitigate luck truly. So on that same scale, I'd say 33% of the game is player skill, and then the other 66% is luck. Is luck. I, I'm, I think just, there's competitive magic. I, definitely I think do. there's competitive magic, yeah. and you're putting too much weight on luck, because the thing is, most of the what you will say, and this this is ongoing on a really bad term that I don't like, which is meta, is that the generals that are played in meta have a like have a strategic and uh, keyword the words that say in the box of the ability just advantage. Are, yeah, just it, advantage there is too. just yeah. so much advantage. Take the usual typical boogeyman in the room, which is Thresus Stimna. Yeah, draw. it's. It draws all the time. So let's say luck. Is there luck when you draw three, you're four just, cards? You're just each helping turn? mitigate you the problem yes, of yeah. seeing so few cards by seeing a lot of cards. And it's the same thing with Xur when you could just cheat out your Necropotence and go through, not draw, but go through a good 30 of your cards and just be like, okay, well, these are in my hands. There's no way I can fail. But even still, you can whiff on those turns. I mean, it's rare, but there are occasions when Thrasios and Timna go off and don't win after an ad nauseum, or Zura goes off with his Necropotence and doesn't win. You can only do so much to mitigate luck, but it is still a factor in those games. However, you are helping to mitigate it with the amount of draw you get to see. Same thing like, with Joyra. But, but that's, that, that's with, because your general choices, what makes something more competitive than others is the innate ability of each creature. Mm -hmm. Again, Crisis Team now, Kes, Sir, all those things that are considered the meta, they do it they consider meta because they are oppressive and they are superior in what they do compared to other creatures. I think they're the most efficient at winning games with a set strategy. Yes, that's a what, subset of strategies. That's a lot of I other said. commanders run a lot of the same strategies. Like you know, there's a lot of other decks that run Labman, Jace, all those those game winning strategies that we see so often that aren't as efficient because they lack the commanders or the people in the commander seat that help them get yeah. there. Yeah. That's all. That's I feel all like it feels more luck based because you also have to deal with four players luck. Instead of just one versus one, it's like me versus you who can never manipulate that better. When you have three other players at the table, it's it's a lot of factors that you're throwing in. Um, and poor threat assessment definitely adds to that. You know, you, you blow up the stacks piece and you blow it up and you don't have a follow up. You let someone else win on top of that. So certainly throw the game a lot more in yeah. Commander, Commander and just Commander in general. Even, I think even, Commander even, even is less then. so than like a 1v1 game for sure. I think yeah. Commander is less competitive inherently over any other format in Magic aside from Brawl and any other mm -hmm. multiplayer format because of other players being involved in the game. Not everyone's going to be playing at the same skill level or not everyone's going to be playing with the most efficient cards so that will hamper other strategies, other person's games. Should people be making the wrong choices? And you're right. Mm -hmm. And that's something we want to hit on in just a moment, actually. But I think at this point, we've probably defined, or at least our base thoughts on what makes a game competitive. I truly don't believe that Commander can ever be really competitive. I know we like to throw that term around. It's just a good way of saying you're getting to see some of the best decks in action, or at least the decks that are best at what they do in action, and hopefully some of the best players behind them. And that is a huge determining factor as to whether a deck is successful or not. Threat assessment, which is something we want mm -hmm. to definitely hit the nail on the head 
uh, for this is something we talk about in our game group all the time things we discuss outside of a match things we discuss during a match like is that the right choice for you do you want to do that some of that is what I'd consider politics in our, in our game group. To get when someone throws down that nature's claim, it's like, do you want to do that or do you want to hit the risk study instead? Or like, whatever the scenario is, you can sort of redirect and or help make better choices for that person or perceivably better choices for that person. Um, <laughs> mind game them mind into game them. whatever your plan is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely mm -hmm. agree. But you can switch someone else's own threat um, assessment on the fly too, and that's what makes the game fun. But if you're intuitive and you know what's up, if you know how that opponent wins based off of their deck, you've seen it play out. If they play this card and you know they win with it, you know, you're not gonna be fooled. Mm -hmm. You can usually, your threat assessment's pretty sharp, but that does come with the understanding of the game as well. But sometimes we do see the same mistake play out over and over again. Yeah. You know. A competitive degree also, that it also kind of segues from politics into an understanding of what's going on in the board. Mm -hmm. What are you playing against? What do they have? What could they possibly do mm -hmm. to say, okay, I'm going to go off in this turn. I'm going to say, I'm going to play this, 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 and I win. According from this, the setup they have in their own board. You it's, know it's deciphering complex board states. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And you can only gain that through either experience, which means play, 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 and then play more with different people, say uh, Cockatrice, go around in different pods, you make your own deck different, play other stuff, or, which is the more tedious one, is study decks. It's, you need to study deck lists, study what's, what's, the, what's the best thing having around, mm -hmm. what's the best strategies, how to counter it, that's knowledge of the format, knowledge of possible meta if you're going blind. Well, I think the format gets more competitive when you understand the meta, you understand the threats you're going to fade. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yes, we all build our lists to be competitive in a blind meta, meaning I'm not going to fine tune my deck list compared to what Patrick or Ernesto is doing, but I'm going to keep in mind, like, what is this good against? Is this good against the majority of things? Then, of course, I'm going to build it. Yeah. But I'm not building something directly to counter yours. Correct. A redundancy no. of effects and or a certain number of effects to help you combat what you understand is going to be in any particular game, because there's always mm -hmm. offenders in any particular meta. Like, if you need a piece of removal for the Notion Thief you're expecting from one or two players, you're going to have that piece of removal in there anyways. It's just how much of that effect you add in to help you interact with those individuals when they're playing. And I think threat assessment changes from... And this is where I would say that you could distinguish a competitive game as opposed to a casual game and how threat assessment plays a larger part in those games. Because mm -hmm. in more casual formats, you'll strike bargains to have some sort punished. of... You don't get punished for bad threat assessment. Yeah. That's, well, that's that, the major and thing. Like, you can say like, hey, if you don't kill me now, I'll help you with your next turn. Yep. Things like that. And that sort of adds to the fun of a more casual game where competitive would be more cutthroat. However, I we also do that. We also kind we of do. like, hey, try, try, uh, don't kill me and I'll try to maybe like I don't know try not to lose next time or something that. like that. It's interesting. Well, I don't well, know. well. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've ever relied on the kindness of others in a competitive match. That's at, interesting. At one point, you, you kind of still you think kind of you see that. Sometimes you kind of have to depend on others to carry you through the finish line. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you. Like a lot of the player. But I'm those. But politics, I'm saying, can until you have to counter everything, and you don't have any more counters. I'm and then like, you I'll need to. Right. Politics can inform <laughs> your threat assessment. It might dictate what moves you make if you do strike a bargain with someone, despite whether those moves are the best moves for you in the moment or not. I think that does impact threat assessment on the whole, the politicking aspect of this game, though you don't see much of it in competitive. I think on, on a scale, you're going to see a lot more a politicking in a casual game than you would ever in a competitive game. So that also impacts your threat assessment. Uh, even go, going further into the threat assessment idea, Say, for example, someone is playing CST and they have Training Grounds, which is probably one of the best engines for the deck, mm -hmm. we, we could agree. And with the... what's the tithe? The Smothering Tithe? Smothering Tithe. Uh, he doesn't have Smothering Tithe, but he has Training Grounds, and another person has a Rhystic Study. These are clearly in a vacuum examples. Some people may think, oh, the Rhystic Study is the worst thing because it affects me now. And permanently, but you can always say, oh, I'm going to slow down my game, pay one more, and not give that player the card, but instead destroy training rounds, which that the CST player is going to have effective advantage all the time. They have two mana open, oh, 
Mm-hmm. They're gonna reveal, oh, land or draw it. Yeah, the Tanziger Sometimes... player, the CST player. Exactly. The, the new Kefnet player. <laughs> well, I feel like playing these decks and understanding these decks really give you proper threat assessment. Yep. And, um, you know, playing Mono Blue and playing Mon- Naromea for as long as I have, I've had really poor threat assessment. And understanding, like when I went to Kess, when I went to Tassiker, I got to learn more the, uh, about the top decks. I got to learn and play with all of these powerfully broken cards. And because I knew how to play with them now, I understood their power. And so my threat assessment became way better. Mm-hmm. And I knew what to counter, and I knew what to deal with now. You were like, oh, I'm like this this card wins games on its own. Mister yeah. Remora, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it. Yeah. Eventually, yeah. you're gonna, Fantastic. you're gonna. Yeah. What you're saying there in that scenario is, if you did have a piece of removal, you would advise hitting the training ground before you ever went to the Ristic study. Ristic over Remora in particular, because yeah. Ristic is only one to pay for. So honestly, yeah. in a mid to late game, you can always pay the Ristic study. It's whether you do that or not. You don't ever want to. You don't ever want to give someone cards. Yeah, Let me just never start for by the saying fish. that. Never. But that doesn't mean you have to answer it now. Obviously, training grounds is going to be the bigger of the threats. Have you ever seen Thrasios with training grounds? It's obnoxious. You don't want that on the board. Remember, Thrasios's effect, his activated ability, is only four generic. Well, it's two now. You don't want that on the board. Um, so I definitely agree with you. It it's, it's knowing the difference between which is the most effective piece of what is the best thing to remove with your piece of removal in the moment for sure. That's yeah. a huge part of threat assessment. It's sort of the, the main topic point here for threat assessment is what you uh, do or do not enable on the board state. But a larger part of that, as we discussed, is understanding the meta. So this isn't just your own meta. I would say that for starters, if you're just getting into the game, if you're interested in playing a more competitive commander, of course understand what your pals get rock list does. Of course understand mm-hmm. what your pals Tassiger list does. That will inform your plays, it'll help you make better threat assessment, but it'll also help you understand where they are in terms of their own game plan, so as to better stop them or stifle them from getting to a decisive win. Mm-hmm. Right, so understanding your meta is a huge part of this. So The format in general. Exactly. Just have, having a, a knowledge of the format, you can have a better understanding and navigate every game plan, every game state, mm-hmm. in, to further your own plans and improve your chances of winning, yeah. whatever they may be. Like, say you have the, you are, you set heavily on the luck argument. I'm gonna say that if you understand more of what's going on, there's more, less, less luck. Not, not obviously you can change the top of the deck, but there's kind of less if you try to navigate to the, the lines or try to find the lines that get you the most revenue or the more more chance yes. of mm-hmm. you having a better outcome. Sure, I have a certain anticipation of what my opponent mm-hmm. is going to do, mm-hmm. but I can't deal with it until I see it happen. 100%. You know what I mean? So, 100% already. And if I see that you're not going off in your turn three or your turn four like I anticipate you to do, I can suspect that your luck has probably been shite that whole game. If you haven't been able to execute on the thing you were looking to do, or maybe you just didn't keep the best starting hand. So you're not priority number one for me so far as threat assessment is concerned. But that's reading the, the game. Yeah. That's reading the board. That's also that's knowledge of the game. That's yeah. not really luck. That's sure. understanding what's going on and taking advantage of that. Yeah, and your poor luck. That's true. The only yes. way to understand the meta is to play the game. Um, I mean, we can study lists all day, Yeah. but that doesn't teach you how to play the deck. That doesn't teach you how to fight the deck. No. I, mean, how yeah, to, I mean, how to improve your deck. Understanding exactly. the core cards, however, it does help. Yeah. So to piggyback on what you were saying, you know, learn locally, learn through what your friends are playing at your kitchen table, at your LGS, and then of course if you want to play in a higher level, if you intend to go to a command fest in the future or whatever that com- a competitive tournament might be, understand what the top tier meta is or what the most popular list are, what folks might have tailored their list after to help you make better threat assessment against those players. The basic combos. But, yeah, mm-hmm. but you know, of course, like Justin's saying, you're never really going to know how to handle a situation until it arises. Experience is the best way to inform your decisions. So, of course, you know, if you want to, and I would suggest it, I mean, a lot of people that do play on a competitive level proxy up and face the best list they can mm-hmm. to understand how those lists work and how to dismantle them. Yeah. I think I, it's fair to say. Oh, yeah. Like if you're trying we to play in it. Yeah, exactly. I love doing that. Exactly. If we're trying to play on a competitive stage, you know, not to say that the game's competitive. I want to know if I can keep up. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And I want to know how these decks win so I can dismantle them. How I can beat them when I know my chances. What are you going to put in your belt in your belt? In your deck to answer that specific thing 
say I don't want to bounce, I want a lightning bolt, for example, to the, I don't want to bounce, I want to kill it. So you have certain choices you can make. And understanding the intrinsic value of your cards as the game state changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, a chain of vapor, turn one, is just a chain of vapor. But as that continues, it becomes really crucial. 100%. Yeah, card values constantly change as you play the game. Mm -hmm. And that also goes into the idea of whatever plan you may have at the start of the game with your opening hand, say you kept a good hand with a specific game plan, that changes whatever happens from action to action, even something completely innocuous like uh, someone fetching, that might change you the whole idea because they're fetching, oh, they are tapped out because they don't have lands or for some reason. Then you have to play something. You, well, you don't have to, but you can play something that otherwise you wouldn't have the window to play. Mm -hmm. Say the typical flush. Someone fetched, okay, flash. I'm gonna flush Hulk and I'm gonna win this game right now. Mm -hmm. Nobody like, oh, wow. Whoa, chill. Yeah, yeah. But that's because reading what's going on, taking advantage of that, taking advantage of what's going on, mm -hmm. adjusting your game plan to what's the board state. Because let's be honest, as Sun Tzu once said, plan. No, wait, Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu? someone like that sure. said that all this is art of war. Probably uh, <laughs> all, pl all plans never survive contact with the enemy. I'm pretty sure it was like. Either a U.S. general so, or something so, like, so, so something like that. <laughs> and that U.S. general was quoting. I want to invite so. this man to play commander. Man. Yeah, exactly. seems, seems like a wise man. He seems he can play competitive. <laughs> exactly. Okay, exactly. As he said, uh, all plans never survive contact with an enemy, and in this case, it's the clear example of whatever is in your hand, you need to plan accordingly. But not every deck can do that. True. Not every deck can do that. Not every so deck we, is adaptive. Back to the, the building. Yeah, yeah. But no, I agree. I think that's, and that's actually our next talking point. Obviously, understanding your meta, but moreover, what your deck should be doing. Because there are lists that are greedy, that run very few interactions. But if they're geared towards winning on turn 18 two or three. 18 land on you. 18 land on you. <laughs> that's very yeah. greedy. Yeah. I've never yeah. played that list, but I bet you I can handle that list any day of the week. However, 18 land on you, whatever it is, if you expect that to be the fast combo list, well, then you should be geared towards slowing that person down. While these other players, if you expect an adaptive deck when you see the Tassiker, or you expect a control list when you see Narumea, you'll have a certain anticipation of when they're planning on going off, and obviously what they plan on doing and how they plan on executing it. However, it's more important that you understand what your commander is going to dictate for your list, or even sometimes your 99. Moreover, your 99 is going to do for your list. I think the commander influences what your list might do or might be. Sometimes your commander might not be the win con. And when, it, when someone sees my Savala list, they know I'm going to try to win drawing on turn cards. three, yes. the, the least on turn three, by drawing cards, playing big creatures, drawing more cards, and obviously comboing out in some form or fashion. Yes, um, so we it, know. <laughs> there aren't that many forms of interaction in that list because you know what? I don't anticipate people to stop me or, and or I am playing for a quicker game to resolve than I am a longer game. So we run ways to recur her, run, run ways to protect her, and that's how that list is oriented. But understanding your commander is also vital into playing the best competitive game you can. You know, I've seen lists that are mid to late game lists that are trying to play a fast game that are never going to compete with Xur or Gitrog or any, any of these lists, 18 land Anya, whatever it might be. So understanding how your commander or how your list should be operating and playing to that strength is really important. I think that's also going to alter in a large way how effective your games are. Uh, one thing to take into consideration what you're saying is that even if your general says you have to do this game plan, don't try to dilute your game plan to try to go late game. For example, and this I had this experience, is Narset the Jeska, the, the one that swings and that's incredibly nuts. Oh, of, okay. you just, the Enlightened Master? Yeah, that one. Yeah, that okay. one. Mm -hmm. Don't try to build her to late game because she does not do late game very well unless it's approached the second sign, but that's like, whatever. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, she is a uh, go balls to the wall, go fast, pedal to the metal, and try to win turn two, three with rock, 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 narset, swing. Don't try to do anything else. Which goes into what he's saying. Some generals are not suited to go to late game. Yeah. They just don't. Mm -hmm. Others are definitely meant to be late game. Example, Narumeha. Example, Majora. 
or even your balan. your balan. <laughs> He's super no, late the, game. No, the super the, late game. The, 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 the Tashar can, can win his early his turn two the, or three. He the, can the win. He's adaptive. The Orzov guy. The Orzov guy? Uh, you mean um, Kambal? Kambal, Kambal. Kambal, for example, is also another example of really slow generals that they need their setup, they need their time, they need to say, like, okay, guys, let's slow down the game. I need to wait until I get to my all the mana I need, all the boards that I need to execute my game plan. Mm -hmm. But that's what makes partners so good, because it can be an early game and it can play late They're hyper are, are we going to make this uh, complaining about partners? No, no, not at all. I'm just saying, like, this is why people believe there's a tier list, because mm -hmm. partners throughout the entirety of the game, they're, they're relevant. Or guess, well, they just or sir. Yeah. Or so far as the great so offenders that. are concerned, like Thrasios and Timna, I mean, obviously they do a thing that okay so one is an outlet and then one is obviously card advantage you know it's it, the there's engine. there's no game plan that doesn't want an outlet or card advantage in the command zone so they're adaptive in that sense they can play as quickly as they want they can play as late game as they want mm -hmm. they're just better efficient at handling a game despite the you know the length and turns that that game might traverse whereas decks like git rock are trying to play towards one strategy they want a fast combo so those lists that thrive on taking the game longer don't get that opportunity narumea she doesn't care what's going on she's going to win out over top of your combo turn five turn six whenever you were trying to win and however that game was going she's going to try to win out over top of that hyper adaptive in that sense but is usually running control and again that threat assessment is hyper important there too because mono Even more blue, important, yeah, because you have to get the extract the most value from your cards, your counter spell, your bounces. Especially Naru, because she doesn't draw by herself. Mm -hmm. So you need to have more knowledge of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I do think, um, on the note you were discussing, so far as the tier lists are concerned, and we can discuss that now, I think um, we've gotten much out of the way so far as deck building is concerned, in, in my opinion. It's really just understanding what your commander is trying to do, what your 99 is trying to do, and playing to that strength. Whatever redundancies are going to help you on that game plan, build towards it. Having all the efficient tutors, and these things are tacitly understood. Having all the fast mana, of course, those are going to bolster your game and help you perform better. But so far as the tier list is concerned, I think there are lists and there are commanders that operate more efficiently than others. That isn't to say they are leagues better inherently. I think the skill base of the player commanding them is ultimately going to dictate how well those lists play. And also sometimes being the boogeyman at the table can be a detriment because you're yeah. going to have three people bearing down on mm -hmm. you. Moreover, a list like Balan where no one cares what he's doing. No one cares what Balan is doing. And Balan doesn't really need to hit the table till he decides he wants to win. No, people look at him as a joke. Exactly. But that actually plays to my benefit. So I think there are pros and cons can, to yeah. being the the top tier list. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely pros to being a list that is what would be considered fringe and or on the outskirts of a competitive game because no one's really looking at you like you're an actual threat yep. until you are. The thing is, you also builds into the idea of that some decks are just not as competitive. Like, I agree. say the... A random example, which is a really poor example, the knights, the uncommon knights from Eldraine, which yeah. are awful, are really bad. Sir, sir, Kara. Some, sir, something. The, sir oh, the, only, the only playable. Sir you hating on my mono black commander? The only well, uh, the only playable Conrad's one for okay. me, it's like the red one because it draws cards and does shenanigans. Is that Kara? actually a deck? No, but I might be considered. Well, me, I might build her just. Lols. Oh, that's a really that's bad reason. example then, if he's gonna build it. It's a, <laughs> that's my point exactly! I build bad decks. Uh, that's a really bad example of generals that don't do really do anything. They just... They are there, they're overcosted, the effect is poor, all that stuff. And if you compare them to the boogeyman, they, they just don't add up. And in a sense, there it's true what he's saying that the tier list is not something that should exist. But it does exist. And what I like about it is it influences games, though. Because when you oh, see Gidrog at the table, yeah. and it's it's the scariest threat, people are going to be bearing down on that list. And I've seen it time and time again. Yes, and no. Thrasus and Timna, What's Timna, Tana. Interesting about that is it, it really um, fluctuates threat assessment, because Gidrog can play something, and it might not be the right choice to destroy that card. 
but people will do it because they want to set back that that yeah. top tier commander. Well, they see the squandered them. resource. Everyone's like, oh wait, that helps him win games. Wait, it yes. ramps him, and he gets the the draw trigger off the land going yeah, to his graveyard. Yeah. yeah, you're gonna you're gonna hamper your game by removing that instead, they get instead of my threat off. assessment on the, on them. Yes, yeah. Yeah. wait, guys, they get hyper focused. Remember my turn one Najila that got blown up, and then my mana creep like gone, and I was like, okay, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm out. Howdy. Right, exactly. so. And that's, that's, really and that's true because that's that's a tier one list. I know I need to handle that immediately. That's why the reason I don't play that deal anymore. <laughs> it's not fun being ousted for playing the best list unless everyone is playing. You need a very balanced pot. Yeah. Yes. That's also what I was going to say. If you are, say, I'm going to play TNT, well, others play how to pick up the game and say, okay. Oh, you're playing that? Okay, I'm gonna play. Oh, yeah. I'm gonna play the frog. I'm gonna play the first liver. They have to fight fire with fire. If you put TNT into a pod of Narmea, Balan, and Jora, like well, TNT above all, you are, first head, of all head and shoulders above all. We're but, going to focus that list a little bit. Hundred percent, but because we know that our own lists are not equal in power to that, they're, they're just they're just not. No. So you are going to get focused. You yes. are going to get beating needle into Thrasios. You are going to get sort of fire and ice zapped humility into you, into well, Thrasios. I keep bringing up the idea that I don't want to play the only black deck at the table. I don't want to be the only person on ad nauseum. It sucks because everyone knows it and everyone will focus me. You mean CDC ad nauseum, which is like yeah, CDC, I, don't, I don't play my Tassiger unless I know another person is like. Playing um, on black. You're, on play, black, you're yeah. playing the three best colors in the format. Come on. Yeah. So you're gonna hyper focus me, and that sucks. We need a balanced pod. <laughs> we need a balanced pod. It makes games good. Yes. If you have a balanced pod, games are super fun, but they also go super long. So like the tier list exists. It does. I, in my mind, it does. Like I, I think there I, I are sure commanders and colors that are better than others. Um, but. It's not always relevant when there's an unbalanced pod. Like you're playing this top deck into a more fringe pod, people are going to hyper focus you. But I feel like when people are all playing the same deck, the same power, or the same power level, that tier list kind of dissipates a little bit because yeah. everybody is playing the best stuff. But you still need to have a tier list to compare of what's the best compared to you, at least to see how you gauge compared to other decks. Mm -hmm. He said like, oh, I can't, I can't fight this, so I know I'm on a tier below. Mm -hmm. Or I just somehow I had an inspiration from whatever higher power, and I now have the best list, and I always beat this. So, so by I know I'm by, so by this thought process, is the tier list even a problem? Like, is the TNT deck ever the problem? Because if you play a TNT deck into an unbalanced pod, everyone just focuses you. If you play a TNT deck into a balanced pod, then everybody focuses everybody. The problem is, so is the, it a problem? The problem is when TNT is so good mm -hmm. that even if you get focused, you still win. Does that happen? Yes. Okay. I've seen that happen. Mm. I've seen that happen many times, and that's a problem. That's right. impressive to come out from all of that adversity. Now, I personally see the tier list as a thing. It is structured because there are lists that operate more efficiently than others. You're going to hear me use that word a lot in any discussion regarding a competitive game. There are just lists that are more efficient at doing the thing they intend to do. That doesn't mean they're the best, because I think ultimately, I, and you've seen some of the lists I've constructed here, by no stretch of the imagination would I ever consider them tier one list by what everyone considers the definition of a tier one list, but I'm not playing to build a stronger deck, I'm playing to build a stronger mindset to beat the better decks. You know, I, as a player, am trying to hone myself to compete against these individuals, not their list. Like, I, I feel like I should be able to sit down with any list that's optimized to its height to pull off a certain trick, whether it be Balan smacking with a hammer or Tashar setting up a loop with a series of sacrifices and different. And if you've watched the show, me discussing Tashar, apostles, rewards, things of that nature. I feel like I can always enact my plan A if I know how to handle what my opponents are doing. So I'm trying to be tier one. I'm trying to play a tier one player by being the best player I can be. Not necessarily playing the best deck, because that's not exciting for me. I feel like we can all slam with Xur and, and be totally fine, just dropping Necropotence and drawing all the cards, and whomever gets there first gets to do the thing. That's totally fine. I do think it is a detriment to the player who is the boogeyman in any particular meta, and I think it is hard to come out over top of that adversity. 
So mm -hmm. is it a threat like you're saying? Maybe not. You know, I've I'm always happy to face down what someone thinks is the best deck yeah. because I feel like I can always be the best player if I'm not inebriated. I have and no problems even finding that, partners. Even I love that, it. But I, I just it. like that challenge, it, first yeah. and foremost, because a lot of what makes competitive commander fun for me is the challenge of winning over top of what is seemingly a better deck or a better player or a better opponent in front of me. That That's the thrill of playing a competitive game for me. Mm -hmm. I think that's what took us out of casual. Like when Justin and I started, we were, were playing a more casual game where the games lasted longer, much, much longer. Mm -hmm. And we got one game done in like an hour, 30 minutes, or as opposed to a competitive game where we can play multiple games within that same time span. Yes. So that actually is, is something I want to talk about. Um, is competitive commander fun? Just to have a soft topic to close out this discussion, because a lot of folks really hammer competitive for not being fun. Because when you play a mana crypt, the world is ending. I don't think that's the case. I think the challenge in a competitive game is playing at your best, and it is fun to challenge yourself in that way and challenge your opponents. I, th I find that fun. So I yeah. think competitive commander is only fun if everyone is on the same mindset. A hundred percent. And also the bot is balanced. Yes, if 100%. you're a pub stomp, if you're bringing a Flash Hulk list, That's if you're bringing fine. a TNT yeah. list to a, a bunch of people who aren't as fine-tuned, they consider themselves 75% or, or budget CDH, and you just like slam them with all these ridiculous cards, um, and you, you combo out really soon, and they don't have the answers, they don't have the knowledge to fight against that, it's not fun. No. I think that leaves the sour taste in most, most oh, folks' yeah. mouths. Oh like, yeah, Having yeah. to face that down. It happened to me. For example, mm. I went to a tournament, well, this was for money, so there was an, another another weight which was different hmm. that was kind of badly organized. But even then, I just went my Jora. This was a while back when Paradox Engine was still something. <laughs> Please bring it back. Um, Get those masterpieces now. Oh, oh my god! And I went to the tournament. I just sat down. I drew my I drew my hand. It was a pretty good hand with a soul ring. Okay, so that's a pretty nuts. I just dropped soul ring. Turn three, I went off. I just went off. People were like, what are you doing? You can't go off. Well, nobody told me the rules. Nobody told me anything about not going off. Mm -hmm. And supposedly there was a rule that nobody- You can win before a certain turn? turn yeah, or... before turn five. Um... And that was like, but there's money involved. Why are you adding rules? To dictate what I can dictate win? To dictate what I can win. Because when you draw with... another card, you draw another card, you draw another card, and I have to wait another turn to win on turn five. It's or what if the rule was, that takes the fun away from the guy yeah. that's not yeah. Re Regardless of that, regardless, that's interesting. regardless of that, it wasn't fun for me to win on turn three because the others were just like, I'm just cold fishing. I'm just yeah, fine. nobody just, can no, Nobody it. could do anything. I'm just, I'm just cold fishing. Like turn three, I'm like, okay. CG just gets a really bad rep for that. Exactly. And, and yeah. people, yeah. it's because... People look at it and they don't understand that you need a certain mindset to play this game. When everyone is on an equal balanced playing field, it's, it's, the best. it's really fun. It's so fun. Yes. It really is the best, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Because you get to play so many more games than you would in a casual format. And let alone that, you get to play some of the best games because everyone is playing at their best or at least trying to. Super the most optimized cards. list, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. It's fun facing that down. If you like a good challenge, I think that's what makes competitive EDH very very fun and engaging i do think it gets a bad rap just because a lot of people for fun go out and troll some folks some more more casual list or slower list and just pop stomp them with the most ridiculous things yep. i can see that that goes to say another thing is that what we find fun mm -hmm. it's say not like, fun for everybody it's not fun for everyone it's like some people may not find fun to say like i'm trying to go off turn three because i drew i drew a good hand or i just and twister and do random shenanigans. People don't find that fun. Some no. people. Some people want to say like, I'm gonna assemble Chandra Tron for reasons. Yeah. And people find that fun. That's completely fine. It's a good thing to have to mm -hmm. have fun with the cards, like read them, have a flavor. It's not for CDH. No. And if you try to approach the I'm gonna have a Chandra Tron in CDH. You're gonna have a bad time. And a lot of people outside looking in um, see CDH and they have this myth where it's like everyone hears turn three format. It's not a turn not. three format. What not it basically about, means, especially lately, yeah. especially late, lately, they well, get the format all that means is, is by turn three you should just be able to answer a threat. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Or, or, or sometimes before. because if you cannot answer a specific threat, sometimes even turn one this happens. Decks can win. Yep. You just need to have a. Uh, a list that has answers for the meta. 
yeah. and most casual lists mm -hmm. don't run in nothing direction so that's why they exactly. like in a, in a different uh, not mindset that's a when's the last time you saw someone win on turn 3 in our games ooh it's been a while a long time it's been a yeah. while mm -hmm. yeah. as I said because also the format itself has slowed down it, it, the value engine is better overall mm -hmm. than the I try to go off turn 1 right now no 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 like the no CDC, like even your Shabala, you have to you slow her down to have more consistency. I can't remember the last time I won turn three with her. I can't remember the last time I won turn three with Anya, and it's not that I couldn't push the win then. It's because I knew that it there would safe. be there will be answers. There would be kickback. Yep. Like when I see everyone's untapped and they're looking at me, yep. and they likely know <laughs> I Sarkong <laughs> triumph for a World Gorger Dragon, they know that I have the win. So they're all waiting on me to make the move. And it's But you it's have so another, no other option. Yeah, Because and it's... you are the, as we were discussing before, you have to understand who, who, what deck is the aggressor, which one is the one proactive, and which one is the reactive. Mm -hmm. Say, mm -hmm. the example, his example, the yeah. always example we use is yeah. your Nevomeha. Nevomeha is we always be reactive. Mm -hmm. Unless it's trying to go off and then he, it has critical mass of the combo and 3,000 counters ahead to protect it. Mm -hmm. That's the critical mass for him. Anya is, I try to go now. Yeah, and as Most soon as time. possible. And the but issue with her is, I wouldn't wow, say she's was... top tier because she's not as resilient as most because her yeah. combo, it's one of the toughest to effectively win with in the game with World Gorger Dragon because if you fail on that, it's the you most fail in a really it's exact way. The most well, you you fail in a really bad way. So if you are playing like an eighteen land on your list and your World Gorger destroys all the lands you had and your everything's exiled at this point, you're gonna have a really hard time uh, coming back from that. Whereas some other lists are, are more resilient in nature. So Anya is a really tough one. Like you definitely have to wait beyond three, beyond four. But that's how she works. Mm -hmm. Well, I generally, I try to win with Necromancy now because that lets me almost like Naru win at instant speed. So long as Anya's out, that to me is more advantageous. So I might even adapt just having played that list enough times to making her more of a mid-range deck. And, and almost always relying on Necromancy for my wins because I know I can win out over top of someone else's combo given the opportunity. You know, mm -hmm. Anya ditching the World Gorger, Necromancy hitting the World Gorger. I, I really wish more people played our format, and I feel like a lot of the reason people don't is because they have this misconception that it is a turn three format, but even more so, it's a huge barrier of entry to get good at this format. I mean, price. price is one thing, but understanding all of these combos when you're not accustomed to it, understanding all of these different value engines and why they're good. You look at Carpet of Flowers and you're like, okay, this is like making me mad at, but you don't understand how valuable that is mm -hmm. in a game such as ours. Mm -hmm. So Your tune 2 could be your turn 4 because you suspect that you're going to see a tropical island with another island on the field from an opponent. You're going to see multiple mm -hmm. islands. There's usually at least one blue player. And this is another meta-dependent thing, but yeah, there's value in cards that a casual player wouldn't see as opposed to a competitive yeah. player because they're just... I mean, those dual lands are a thing, like you were saying, the cost barrier, a lot of folks can't afford a tropical mm -hmm. island, so you're, or a volcanic island. Not even tropical, not, the, the yeah. typical, the pack, the normal pack of fast mana, of mana grip, mox diamond, mm -hmm. and mox opal, that pack of mana is like, what, Couple like, hundred. Like 500 bucks or something well, like I mean, that? That's or 400, I, still, like, that's the We, gate, we keep getting to the point where it's like, we, we support proxy. Yeah, at least in 100%, our group. Yes, yes. I will teach any new player how to play. I will proxy up a list because I just want you to play our format. Yeah. And, you know, price is a barrier, unfortunately, but it's not for everybody. And if we proxy... Mm -hmm. If your pod supports proxying, 100% mm -hmm. support it, 100% try it our, our own format because it's so fun. It's... What you... what As people in casual... Uh, we were, uh, going back to what you were saying, as people in casual find fun, you might have the same or more if your mindset comes to the idea of investing the time into learning a new format mm -hmm. that you might say oh wow this is this is better than i thought mm -hmm. this is this is not what I, people told me it was that's and funny how you distinguish it as a completely different format and of course you know it kind of is it, it is yeah. it, it it's is like comparing way. standard and modern in a sense mm -hmm. because standard is way slower and modern it's a country but they both have okay <laughs> but they both have Oko. And guys, even um, CDH has Oko now. 
<laughs> it's true. CNH does have Oko and Casual does it as well. Oh but my on God. that note, I think, you know, prioritizing your buys is a topic for a different day. But I think mm -hmm. the thing we should all extend out to you is if you want to play competitive, if you are ever wondering what is this myth of competitive, what proxy what makes, dub. Exactly. Or what makes competitive it. competitive? Well, once you find out yourself, I think it's a good idea to play digitally on Cockatrice mm -hmm. and or just proxy up and play with your pals at home. Some of these lists, some of the lists we've showcased here, and of course there's a lot of other content creators that have made excellent lists. Try to play the best decks to see what is up with this format, because it's definitely worth playing. And get everyone on the same mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a segue, this deck, this is my Kefnet deck, which is proxied because I own all the things. This is 20 bucks. With the deck box, with the sleeves, mm -hmm. everything, 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. If you are not playing CDH with your pot allowing your proxies, it's because you don't want to. Let's be honest. It's 20 bucks. And yeah. you have a whole deck you can tune, so that, oh, I'm gonna print a new, a new, some cards, and it's like one, one buck, mm -hmm. each, each page, with color, so... Yeah. Cost of admission there is yeah. not difficult, guys. No. Of course, you know, I intend to go to Command Fest in DC this December, hopefully Same. I'll see you guys there. I know Inosa is planning on going, just unfortunately can't come, but, you know, Sorry. for something like that, I'm gonna have all my cards set aside, the actual cards in a list, perhaps Balon, perhaps something else to compete with some of you guys. And of course, if you see us there and are ready to throw down, bring your best list because we'd love to play against you. But guys, I'm Patrick Marlette. If you wanna discuss anything we discussed today, you can do so in the comment section or I highly encourage you to join us over on Discord. We're all the, mm -hmm. always holding conversations there. We're always having people get inside and like, hey guys, how can I change this? Or mm -hmm. hey guys, I have this list, how can we change? How can we improve? Even People give us give us insight on what's going on because we might oh we don't know about this list like card like some random obscure card that we don't know. Mm -hmm. Some people sometimes do that like oh impressive. Yeah, I love this card. Yeah, Come learn with us. I am Ernesto Salazar. You may find me as Plasma Beam in Discord, League of Legends, probably most every uh, most of the video games I play. You may find me as that in AGM. I will now be looking for you on League of Legends, but <laughs> you say that now. Worlds, the world's just happened. Did you watch that? <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. I'm Justin Rodriguez, and I'm also uh, Jarizos. Happy Bruin, babies. <laughs>